Hello, hello, hello. In this video, I'm going to be giving some of my debating tips to those of you who like to debate Catholicism. And this goes back to that 666 video in the comments section. For those of you that were debating on the Catholic side, I'm not suggesting you did anything wrong, nor am I suggesting my technique is better. Just offering tips that you can use. If you're Protestant watching this video, it's probably not going to be very beneficial to you unless you're starting to question your beliefs. Okay, first things first. Realize, you probably know this, I have two uh, courses on Udemy. One of them is a deep dive into Catholicism, and it's six hours long. The other is free, and it goes over the simple passages of debating with Protestants in the typical arguments that come up. I highly recommend those courses if you like debating religion and Catholicism. I'll put a link in the description, and just know that I don't control the prices on Udemy, but every two weeks, those courses go on sale for $16.99 or $14.99. So if you click on that link and it says $54.99, I would not buy that. Okay, so there is an argument that we, you will see, typically from born-again Christians, questioning the size of the rock that Peter was called. This comes from John uh, chapter 1, verse 42, when Jesus calls Simon, son of Jonah, you will be Kephas or Cephas. And they suggest that that word is a small pebble if you go to the Greek translation of Petros or Petros. The first point I use is if the English translation of the Bible is flawed and cannot be trusted, then their journey towards salvation is screwed because they don't have a church for which to rely on. Let me give you an analogy. Let's suppose you took a college course in history. And on Monday of that course, the professor came in and he spoke Aramaic. On Tuesday, there was a new professor. He came in, he spoke Greek. On Wednesday, there was a new professor. It was a woman and she spoke Hebrew. On Thursday, another professor, he came in, he spoke Latin. On Friday, thankfully, uh, an English professor came in. How well are you going to do in that course? And would you want your money back? When people use different translations to change the meaning of, of the English translation, what they don't realize is they're feeding into the atheist argument that the Bible can't be uh, divinely inspired because it's been passed on for so many generations. It's like that whisper game that you did in, as a kid and you went around a circle and told a secret in someone's ear and then it went around the circle and, and what was the end result of that secret and it was something completely different. That's an atheist argument. If we take this idea that the English translation is flawed and that rock does not mean rock in English, it means small pebble, what we are doing is now calling into question every single word in the Bible that's divinely inspired. That means the word rock was not divinely inspired. Now we have to, it, we're not talking about books or passages. We're talking about words that are divinely inspired. It's not sola scriptura, it's, it's sola word. Which words were divinely inspired? It's so ridiculously ludicrous. Catholics, if someone tries to use a different translation, Greek, Aramaic, Latin, Hebrew, whatever, realize that they're punching themselves in the face and their belief in sola scriptura. The second point of Peter being called a small pebble is that it shows a very poor understanding of Matthew's gospel. The word Kephas or Cephas shows up first in Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 2 verse 11. Paul's epistles are written before the Gospels. What this tells us is that the early Christians called Peter Kephas. John's Gospel, where Peter gets the official name change, that's chapter 1, verse 42, where Jesus calls him Kephas, that's written last in the 90s, 90 AD. 
So let's go back to Matthew's gospel and the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, where Jesus says that wise men build their house on the rock. Eight chapters later, at the apex of Matthew's gospel is where Jesus says in Matthew 16, uh, verses 17 through 18, that I will build my house, my church, on you, Peter, the rock. He is not going to build his house on a small pebble that can be tossed around from the waves of the sea. Early Christians understood this even before John's gospel is written. They understood that passage and what it meant. Okay, sorry if I get a little fired up talking about religion. My apologies. Next argument, um, we're going to stay in Matthew's gospel and the general theme of the church, and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 18, two chapters after Jesus says he's going to build his church. In that chapter, Jesus says, if your brother sins, let him know about it. If he doesn't listen, go to your neighbor. If he doesn't listen to you two, go to a couple more people. Ultimately, if he doesn't listen to those people, you take it to the church. If he doesn't listen to the church, then cast him out of the church as a heathen. Here, Jesus gives authority to his church, not the laity, not the people, the church. It's an entity. It's still going with the general theme. The wise men build their house. Jesus is going to build, a th build his house on Peter. And now it's a separate entity that has authority. What does this passage mean to Protestants? Can you get tossed from sola scriptura? Can, you, can the Bible excommunicate you? No. But you know who was tossed from the entity, the church? The guy who drew up the doctrine of sola scriptura. He was excommunicated. Let's discuss Martin Luther and his beliefs. Martin Luther believed in infant baptism. He believed in confession and penance. He believed in Eucharist, although he called it uh, substantiation, not uh, transubstantiation. He believed in religious images. He believed in Mary and her perpetual virginity. So the author of Sola Scriptura has a lot of Catholic ideas. The problem for Protestants is they have to pick and choose which ones were right and which ones were wrong. This is terrible footing to be standing on as a foundation for your belief system. You can be tossed around from the waves of the sea or the wind, like Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, tossed to and fro from the winds of false doctrine. It baffles me that those who believe in Sola Scriptura cannot see Eucharist in the Bible, it's clearly in there. The early Christians were practicing Eucharist as shown in the letters of uh, Justin Martyr in 150 AD. I did three videos on Eucharist. You can find them on my channel, which gives all the passages referring to Eucharist. I encourage you to use Eucharist in your debates because you can twist a Protestant's mind into a pretzel having them try and explain sola scriptura, Bible alone, without Eucharist, while at the same time the early Christians were practicing Eucharist. So how do you get around that? Okay, so the last argument we're going to discuss is idols or religious images. This is taken from the Ten Commandments, um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 and 5. Although many Protestants don't want to accept verse 5, and they'll just take verse 4 and say, you shall not make any images of anything in heaven, here on earth, or beneath the sea. Verse 5 says, you shall not bow down and worship those images that you created of anything in heaven, uh, here on earth, or in the sea. The first thing we should at least point out, that this commandment comes out 1200 BC in a pagan dominated world. Why did God include anything beneath the sea? Because he knew the 
people would pick a fish out of the sea or something from the sea and make it the goddess of sea or the god of tides. Now, this disbelief in any image comes from the 1520s in the radical Protestant Reformation. We talked about that and iconoclasm. And sadly, this belief comes during one of the most iconic uh, periods in history, the Renaissance and the Renaissance art, such as the Last Supper and the Statue of David. The problem that commandment has for Protestants uh, trying to use it is, is that passage reads any image in heaven, earth, or beneath the sea. So for us who are using our phones, our internet, our television, photo albums, uh, billboards, any image is a sin. Unless, of course, you've misinterpreted or misunderstood that commandment. We know that the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament had statues on it, and God commanded Moses to put the cherubim on top of it. We also know in Exodus that God commanded Moses to create a serpent and put it up on a, a stick to heal the Israelites. We also know in the New Testament, in Mark chapter 12, when the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus, and they're talking about paying taxes to Caesar. And Jesus says, bring me a coin. And they bring him the coin. And he says, whose face is on this? Uh, and they say, it's Caesar's. And that's where you get that line, pay to Caesar. What is Caesar's? And give to God what is God's. Take notice that the Pharisees, who were the leaders of the Jewish people, apparently didn't know the second commandment if the images of their coins have Caesar on them. And Jesus doesn't seem to know either because he doesn't mention anything about the second commandment. He just takes the coin. It doesn't say that he handles it, but it certainly implies that. And he gives it back to him and says, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. I mean, what the heck, Pharisees and Jesus? That's a sinful item, apparently. And you're not off the hook either, Moses. You put two statues of angels on the ark in the holiest place, the holy of holies. I'm waiting for Protestants to tear down Mount Rushmore and the Statue of Liberty. Remember a couple years ago, there was a controversy over uh, Civil War generals and statues. And it was the evangelical Republicans that said, keep those statues up. I think the idol argument is, is somewhat comical, and I rarely spend any time debating with people on idols, because it's such a flimsy, it's so bad, it's such a bad argument. Well, I didn't get to everything that I wanted to cover, but I don't want to take any more of your time. Uh, my apologies for this being a longer video, but thank you for listening to my shenanigans. Have a great day.